Payback. Yes, Payback is Sunday night, one week removed from SummerSlam. We have Payback on the WWE Network. Really actually looking forward to this one. Initially, when at first uh, we found out that we were going to have Payback, I wasn't massively thrilled or excited about it. But now, a week later, um, I think you have to give you have to give the WWE credit. It's actually been a pretty a pretty solid build uh, to Payback. You look at it. The idea was, and we we heard this news coming out or uh, prior to SummerSlam, rather that we were going to have uh, payback a week after SummerSlam, and everyone universally, myself included, went, "That is crazy. Why are we having payback? Why are we having a pay per view seven days after the second biggest show of the year? It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a silly idea." Fast forward seven days later, I think it worked. I think it's worked. The reason I say that is because the card looks good. I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with the card that we have right now. At the moment, the time of recording, there's only six matches on this card, and I do think we will get more matches announced over over the weekend prior to payback going on the air. But I think uh, I think it's a good card. I think it's a good card. I think it's a solid card. Most importantly about this card, there are no SummerSlam rematches on this card, which to me is an absolute. Uh, it's shocking, if anything. WWE loves their rematches, right? They love their rematch clauses, even though there aren't apparently any rematch clauses anymore. But they love their rematches. They do rematch, SummerSlam rematches or pay-per-view rematches on Raw, on SmackDown. They do them on following pay-per-views. It feels like the day after you have the match on a big pay-per-view, the following night on Raw or the following Friday on SmackDown, you find out that there's going to be a rematch for the following pay-per-view. And that's a month later let alone a week later, and they haven't done any SummerSlam rematches. So you have to give the WWE credit there. And there's a lot of buzz for this event. There is a lot of buzz for this event because obviously the return to the ring of Roman Reigns and the angle that happened on SmackDown last night and uh, the, the the debut pay-per-view match of Keith Lee too. So there's a lot of buzz around this pay-per-view. It doesn't feel like a throwaway event. And that's the biggest credit I think you have to give with WWE to pay back here. It doesn't feel like a throwaway event. And how many pay-per-views have we seen from WWE in the last few years where it's a month later from the previous pay-per-view and it feels like a throwaway event? It feels like, ah, they're just saving uh, it to another event. Or they're just waiting. This is filler into another event. We've had those Saudi shows where there's been a WWE pay-per-view a week later or a couple of weeks later and that feels like a throwaway just forget about it event and uh, here we have a pay-per-view seven days after SummerSlam and it feels like it's an important event it feels like it's must see so you have to give the WWE credit for that one so what we're going to be doing in this video, we're going to be doing a bit of preview, a bit of predictions, breaking some of the matches down, giving you my thoughts, my opinions, my predictions. But before we do, though, let's have a word from one of the great supporters of Wrestle News 365. Support for Wrestle News 365 is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Now, Manscaped, for all of my UK fans out there, Manscaped just launched in the UK. Over here in the United Kingdom, we have gone for years and years and years without using the right tools for the job. But now, you can be one of the first men in England to experience their life-changing product. But it's not just limited to all of the great fans over here in the UK. This offer goes worldwide, so all of my friends over in America and around the world that are listening to this, this offer still does apply for you. You can still use our code. Uh, but I've got to tell you a quick story first. Now, there have been so many times, right? I'm a guy. Uh, you got to you got to groom down there, fellas, right? That's the most important thing. You've got to keep yourself trimmed. You've got to keep yourself proper. And uh, a lot of the time, I've been guilty of this, of using the wrong tools for the job. I've had incidences, I'm not afraid to say it, where things have been nicked, snagged, or in fact cut down there because I wasn't being careful enough and using the right equipment. And that just shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. You don't want to be worrying about cutting yourself down there. Do you know how painful that is? I can tell you, it hurts quite a lot. And I wish... And hope to God it never happens to me again. And it won't happen to me ever again because I'm using Manscaped products. That's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. The Manscaped engineering team has perfected the greatest ball hair trimmer ever created. Big statement, but it's absolutely true. They have just released the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0 in the UK. It's also 
available around the world as well. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. So those cuts and snags that I was telling you about before are a thing of the past. And let me tell you, when I tell you this is premium, I mean premium. The battery will last up to 90 minutes so you can get a longer, perfect shave. And not only that, you don't want to be cutting yourself and trimming yourself in the, all over the bathroom, getting hair all over the place. That's just disgusting. The lawnmower has a waterproof technology that allows you to groom in the shower, so no more mess. And one of the coolest features, one of my favorite features about the lawnmower is the LED light which illuminates grooming areas for a closer and more precise trimming experience. So you can shave longer, you can shave more precisely, and you can shave in the shower. What more did I need to tell you? They've also upgraded to a 7000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology and let's not forget about the charging stand you can show off your mower loud and proud because this intelligently designed stand is a convenient charging dock powered by USB so if you are listening to me speak right now I want you to experience it firsthand for yourself let's get that bush to tush clean and you can get 20% off and free shipping yeah you heard me right there 20% off and free shipping. All you have to do is use the code 365 wrestle at manscaped.com. Make your testies their besties. That's 20% off and free shipping. Not only are you getting 20% off, you're getting free shipping as well with the code 365 wrestle at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code 365 wrestle. Your balls will thank you. So let's get into the matches. Now, this isn't going to be the exact order of the matches. As I mentioned at the start of the video, there's most likely going to be matches that are added over the weekend. At the time of recording, there's only six matches on the card. I would be stunned if WWE did a pay-per-view with only six matches on the card. That's very low for them, considering you've got the kickoff show and other things like that. So I'm sure we'll see maybe one or two matches added in here. We'll have to wait and see. But the first match... Uh, that we're going to talk about here is Matt Riddle versus King Corbin. Now, this was a match that was added last night on Friday Night SmackDown. And I'm going to be brutally honest here. I don't care for it. I, I really don't care for it. Um, I'm a big fan of Matt Riddle. I think he's got a lot of potential. I was a big fan of his work in NXT. He's another one. And I, and I did a video on this earlier this week. I did a stream about it this week when I was speaking about the debut of Keith Lee on Monday Night Raw about Vince McMahon changing things, about WWE changing things. When someone comes in from NXT to Raw or SmackDown, they have to be changed, right? Something has to be changed about them, whether it's their music, whether it's their look, whether it's their promos, something has to be changed. Now, Matt Riddle hasn't suffered uh, as badly as Keith Lee maybe has with the theme music changing and the look changing, etc. However, what I will say has changed a lot about Matt Riddle for me has just been his promos. I think his character, they're, they're just over the top. It's over the top with the bro stuff. In NXT, I get it. He's the original bro. That's his character. That's Matt Riddle. He's laid back, but then he gets in the ring. He's a former UFC fighter. He'll beat the hell out of you. He's credible. And Vince McMahon... To his credit and to the credit I think of Matt Riddle, unfortunately for Matt Riddle, Vince McMahon is a big fan of Matt Riddle. When those um, those those these rankings, essentially, these insider booking sheets were released a couple of weeks ago, whereby you found out who was the top three baby faces on SmackDown. Now, at the time, Braun Strowman was still the Universal Champion and he was a baby face. So Braun Strowman was the number one baby face. The second baby face was Jeff Hardy. That can be seen as Jeff Hardy is now the WWE Intercontinental Champion. Uh, and the third baby face was Matt Riddle. So that shows Matt Riddle and Bruce Pritchard, they're big fans. Bruce Pritchard actually... Prior to even coming back to WWE, if you're a regular listener to his podcast, Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard, he actually said before WWE had signed Matt Riddle, they should look into signing Matt Riddle. So that shows that Bruce Pritchard is a big fan of Matt Riddle. And that's evident by the way that he's been booked on SmackDown. You know, he debuted interrupting AJ Styles. He had that great match against AJ Styles. And he's he's done well. He, he's done well on SmackDown. However, I just feel like it doesn't feel like the same Matt Riddle that we've seen in NXT. It doesn't feel like that same Matt Riddle. I, I can't put my finger on it. Everything's a bit too, you know, bodacious, barefoot bro. Everything's a bit too corporate there for me. And it's a bit too, let's hit the taglines. Let's hit this. 
he's Matt Riddle. He, he's barefooted, right? He's bare feet. And he had to explain why he's in bare feet. And stuff like that, it just it doesn't resonate with me as much as uh, Matt Riddle had done in NXT previously. And when it comes to the Matt Riddle King Corbin feud, we knew this was going to happen because it's been on the cards for a long time. This had been um, on the cards since Survivor Series last year. King Corbin eliminated Matt Riddle from the five on five on five Raw versus SmackDown versus NXT traditional Survivor Series match. King Corbin eliminated Matt Riddle from the Royal Rumble. So the plan always was to have Matt Riddle face King Corbin when he came to SmackDown. And once everyone knew that was the case, I think everyone universally rolled their eyes and went, oh, great. Because, and this isn't a slide against King Corbin. I think King Corbin is, it's not his fault the way that he's booked. It's not his fault the promos that are given for him. It's not his fault that some of the things that are written for him. But let's be honest, since he became the king of the ring, and even prior to becoming the king of the ring, his feuds are very dull. That feud against Roman Reigns was very, very dull last year. It was bad, badly written. It had bad writing. It went on way too long and it was boring. No one cared for it. And I think it was universally panned because it was poor. The same thing you had that feud with Elias around WrestleMania time. It was boring. It was poor. It didn't make any sense. And as soon as we heard that Matt Riddle was going to be facing King Corbin, everyone went, uh, fine, but it's not going to be great. It's gone on already too long. Last night on SmackDown, they had the match that hyped up payback. You had Shorty G, who's aligned with King Corbin now. Why he's still called Shorty G, that still makes my blood boil, to be honest. He attacked Matt Riddle last night. He had a match with Matt Riddle that lasted about 90 seconds, which is a disgrace to both Matt Riddle and Chad Gable. Chad Gable is way better than that. Way, way, way better than that. And... This feud just doesn't do anything for me. And once it got announced last night, well, we're going to have Matt Riddle versus King Corbin at Payback. I just sort of shrugged and went, OK, fine. The match will be fine. I have no doubts about that, but I just don't care. I'm not invested in this. King Corbin has been the King of the Ring now for nearly a year. He won the King of the Ring tournament after Class of Champions last year. And a year later, does he still need to be the King of the Ring? No, it hasn't really done anything for him. The idea... The idea that if you win the King of the Ring, you have to wear a crown and a cape and walk around with a scepter and declare yourself the king is so overdone. It's so overdone. The only guy in the modern era, and I say modern, this was what, 15, 14 years ago or whatever, to make it work was King Booker. But that's because he was so over the top and Booker T's a Hall of Famer. That's the only reason why that worked. Why can't you just win the King of the Ring and say, I'm the best? That's the modern way of doing it. And that's the way they did it in the Attitude Era. That's when you had people like Ken Shamrock win it. You had guys like Edge win it. Billy Gunn, I think, won it. Basically, it was just to say, I'm I'm great. I'm the best. Now I'm getting elevated to the next level. You didn't walk around with a crown and a cape and a scepter then because it was dumb then and it's dumb now and they don't need to do that. So I don't really care for this feud. I don't really care for this match. Again, the match itself, I'm sure will be fine. Matt Riddle has great matches. King Corbin has good matches too. But I just don't care for it. I don't care for it. And that's just me at the moment. Uh, in terms of the winner, Matt Riddle was going to win this one, I think. I'd be very, very surprised if King Corbin got the victory here. By all accounts, King Corbin was hesitant to work with Matt Riddle because he knew he's going to be putting Matt Riddle over. And King Corbin, you look at his recent feuds, lost to Raymond Reigns, lost to Elias. And now he's going to lose to Matt Riddle too. King Corbin doesn't have the best of luck recently when it comes to his feud. He's trying to protect his character. Maybe the best way to protect his character is remove this stupid King gimmick from him. I think that might be the best thing for him. So I think Matt Riddle is going to leave payback with the victory here. Next, we have the WWE United States Championship on the line. We have United States Champion Apollo Crews defending against Bobby Lashley. But unlike MVP at SummerSlam, where MVP was not allowed Bobby Lashley and Shout Benjamin in his corner, this Sunday at Payback, Bobby Lashley will have his Hurt Business colleagues, Shout and Benjamin and MVP, in the corner of the almighty Bobby Lashley. Uh, this, is, this should have been the match that happened uh, at SummerSlam, to be honest. I was very surprised going into SummerSlam that this was... Uh, this wasn't the match that was done because it felt like the right thing to do. It felt like the, the obvious thing to do. MVP had had the match with Apollo Crews. He was meant to have the match at Extreme Rules, the horror show at Extreme Rules. That match didn't happen because Apollo Crews tested positive for COVID. In storyline, he couldn't pass a physical because of Bobby Lashley. But going into SummerSlam, they'd had the match on Raw. They had the match on Raw, the champion versus champion match. Apollo Crews defeated MVP, became the official undisputed United States champion got the new version of the bout and 
that felt like it. And we had the rematch at SummerSlam. This is why I'm so surprised that Payback at the moment doesn't have any SummerSlam rematches on there because a, a match at SummerSlam was a rematch from Raw. You even look at Bray Wyatt versus Braun Strowman. That was a rematch that they'd done a million times this year too. So it kind of, that's why I'm so surprised that Payback doesn't have any rematches on there because WWE loves their rematches. But this 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 was this felt a bit odd to have it here because it felt like it should have been at SummerSlam. Now MVP at SummerSlam, I think universally we felt that MVP wasn't going to win. At least I did because MVP he doesn't win matches in WWE. I'm a huge fan of his work this year. I think MVP this year in 2020 has been one of the standout performers and characters. Not in the ring. His best days in the ring are past him. You know he's an older guy at the moment. But as a mouthpiece, as a mouthpiece, and as a promo, MVP's been as good as anyone this year. And I'm a, a big fan of the Hurt Business. I'm not a big fan of some of the way that they've been booked recently. I felt that the arm wrestling contest between Bobby Lashley and Apollo Crews Monday Night on Raw was stupid. It didn't make any sense. Uh, it made Bobby Lashley look very weak. And... It, this is the thing that confused me with it. They knew that it made Bobby Lashley look weak because then they had the Hurt Business go into Raw Underground once again, take that over and beat the hell out of everyone. So why make Bobby Lashley look weak in the first place? It didn't make a lot of sense there. The logic to me wasn't there. The thing that I did like about it was seeing the Hurt Business back in Raw Underground because I think they're money there. I get rid of Shane McMahon. I don't see what benefit you have having Shane McMahon hosting Raw Underground if you want to run it like a legitimate, cool fighting club, have the Hurt Business host it. Have Bobby Lashley beat the hell out of people every week. Shouting Benjamin is a legitimate wrestler. Have him wrestle people every week. Have MVP brawl with people every week. That's the money there. That is the real money there. And maybe they will transition into that. The fact that they revisited the Hurt Business going back to Raw Underground makes me think that potentially they will they will eventually take it over. And I do think that's the best thing there. In terms of this match, like I said, I think this was the match that should have been happened at, uh, should have happened at SummerSlam. Should have been happening at SummerSlam. Um, I think the reason that it was bumped to the kickoff show, which was rightfully so, it was the right call to have Apollo Crews and MVP on the kickoff show because, in my opinion, that was probably uh, the worst match on the show, arguably. And and I don't mean that in terms of the match quality. I don't mean that in terms of oh, it was a horrible match. It was horrific. It just it was it didn't feel you know meaningless. It didn't it didn't feel have any meaning to it. It didn't feel like a, a championship match. As I mentioned, MVP's best days in the ring are behind him. I think he's best as a manager, as a mouthpiece who can occasionally work. He's about getting talent over, and it was meant to get the talent over, which was the case of Apollo Cruz. But I felt the money match there is Bobby Lashley versus Apollo Cruz, and I'm glad that that's what they're doing Sunday at Payback. In terms of the prediction here, I think uh, Bobby Lashley leaves the United States champion. I think that's always been the plan to have Bobby Lashley leave as United States champion. I think Apollo Crews has done well as United States champion. And I think he's done better than probably some people thought that he would do as United States champion, if I'm being brutally honest. I think a lot of people were hesitant the way that Apollo Crews had been booked prior to this post-WrestleMania run that he's had, wasn't very good at all. I think a lot of people probably thought Apollo Crews uh, might have been amongst the names to get released in April. But Apollo Crews has turned it around. I think he's done well as the United States champion. I think his promos have improved significantly. And I think his matches have been good. But I think Bobby Lashley, the way that Bobby Lashley has been booked recently is the best that Bobby Lashley has been booked since he's returned to WWE. He returned to WWE in 2018 after a great run with Impact Wrestling, multiple time world champion with Impact Wrestling, booked just like an absolute monster, and the way that Bobby Lashley should be booked. He's a legitimate MMA fighter, uh, and the way that he was booked in Impact Wrestling reflected that, and I think a lot of people were excited, considering the way that Bobby Lashley had been booked in WWE before he left in 2007. He was a main event player, right? Battle of the Billionaires, all of that sort of stuff. ECW champion. I think people thought he was going to be a future WWE champion too. So people were excited to see him back. And the next thing you know, you got him flexing his glutes, doing double biceps. He's with Leo Rush. He's with Baron Corbin. He's doing things with that. It just, it just didn't really work. And I think a lot of people felt a bit let down of, here we go again. Another one comes back, doesn't get booked properly, gets ridiculous stories. Why would you bother coming back? But this pairing with MVP since he became uh, affiliated with MVP and had that WWE championship feud with Drew McIntyre at Backlash Bobby Lashley has been booked 
very, very well and very, very strong. So I expect that to continue Sunday at payback. And I think Bobby Lashley will become the United States champion. Of course, you can factor in here the Cedric Alexander ricochet element here. Of course, Apollo Crews had to pick two guys to face off against the Hurt Business on Raw recently. He picked... Uh, out of Mustafa Ali, Cedric Alexander, and Ricochet. He picked Ali and Ricochet. Alexander didn't look too happy about that. MVP in recent weeks has been teasing, you know, maybe you should come and join us. The office still there. Maybe you should uh, come back uh, and join us, you know. The office there. It's not going to be there forever kind of deal. You're better than that. Uh, and he also chewed out Ricochet Monday night on Raw 2. Now, I think a lot of people assume that this is going to lead to Cedric Alexander joining the Hurt Business, but I'm going to throw a curveball. I think it's going to lead to Ricochet joining the Hurt Business. I think Ricochet is the one that can benefit the most from joining the Hurt Business. There is something there with Ricochet. You can't deny it. Look at his work in NXT. Look at his work on the independent scene. The guy can do things in the ring that a lot of people truly can't. My biggest problem with Ricochet is that I think his promos are god awful and that might seem very harsh and I know some people are going to say well he's just he's just saying what's written for him and that's true that's true the stuff that had been written for him the whole real life superhero cheesy stuff was terrible but even the way that he delivered it was terrible and I think he's something he really needs to work on in the same way with Bobby Lashley Bobby Lashley's promos aren't great they're okay but they're really not great if you have someone like Ricochet have a mouthpiece of someone that can talk, like an MVP, then Ricochet can realistically be money in WWE. Ricochet hasn't recovered from the Brock Lesnar beating, in which Vince McMahon made him the number one contender and then gave up on him, I guess, 10 seconds after he gave him the shot at the WWE Championship. It's now or never, I think, for Ricochet. You either work with him and you try and build him up, or he's going to go. I think if it doesn't get booked properly, he'll end up leaving and going to an AEW because they'll have him. He loves, they love that style, right? That's an AEW type style, the high spot moves. And he'd do very, very well in AEW. And I think WWE knows that. They know the talent that they have there. It's about trying to find the ways to make him work. So I think Bobby Lashley will win, but let's keep an eye out for Ricochet Sunday at Payback 2. Next, we have the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships on the line. We have SmackDown Women's Champion Bayley teaming up with her tag team partner, Sasha Banks, the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, defending the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships against Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax. This, to me, feels like the time that Bayley and Sasha Banks are going to split up, right? It's been coming. It's been teased for a long time, years at this point. We thought that we were going to get the split with Sasha Banks and Bayley. I don't agree with some people. Some people are saying at the moment, Sasha Banks and Bayley, they're the best thing on the show. Now you're going to split them up. How dare you? Why would you split them up if they're the, second, if they're the best thing on the show? That doesn't make any sense. Everything has their time. Everything has their time. Ideally, I'd like to see him stretch it out to WrestleMania next year because I want to see Bailey versus Sasha Banks at a WrestleMania. I think it's a WrestleMania worthy match and a WrestleMania worthy feud. And it would be great if it can get done in a stadium. The only issue is in this current climate, realistically, is it going to get done in a stadium? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. I think at this point we might have fans in the arena, a limited capacity of fans. But a stadium full of 80, 90, maybe even 100,000 people at SoFi Stadium. At this point of time, I just can't see that happening, unfortunately. So maybe they decide to pull the trigger now, which is why we're seeing more and more of this dissension between Bailey and Sasha Banks. Of course, Sasha Banks lost the Raw Women's Championship at SummerSlam to Asuka. This was after she had helped Bailey defeat Asuka at SummerSlam to retain the SmackDown Women's Championship. So there's dissension there. And the dissension really did ramp up uh, last night on SmackDown, where you had the Bailey and Sasha Banks promo. You had Bailey uh, call herself Bailey Doss Straps again, and Sasha, my best friend Sasha kind of deal. Then she brought up the fact that. Sasha Banks has never retained the Raw Women's Championship, right? She's been champion, what is it, three, four times? And every single time that she's had it in her first title defense, she's lost. Which is fun to bring up because it's a thing that definitely a lot of the fans bring up. A lot of the fans talk about how Sasha Banks can't retain a Raw Women's Championship. And it's good to see that WWE at least acknowledging that. At least use your booking failures to your advantage, right? So you have to give them credit for that, I suppose. And also... Friday night on SmackDown, you had Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax interrupt. They were on the big screen. They talked about how 
they hate each other so much, but the only people they hate more are Bailey and Sasha Banks. You're the only two people that could make me like Nia Jax. Shayna Baszler said Nia Jax sucks, which I think probably resonated with a lot of people on social media. Nia Jax said she hates Shayna Baszler, but she hates Sasha Banks and Bailey more, and they're going to take the Women's Tag Team Championships at Payback. Sasha Banks said that Bailey is her best friend, but and Sunday she will get her retribution. And as she said retribution, she stared a hole straight through Bailey. Bailey didn't notice this, but this was purposeful. This was a subtle tease that potentially Sasha Banks is going to turn her back on Bailey on Sunday. And do you know what? I don't think she will. I don't think Sasha Banks is going to be the one to turn on Bailey because it's too obvious at this point. We saw the way that Sasha Banks looked at Bailey. We saw that. We saw that Sasha Banks isn't happy with Bailey. We saw that Bailey's trying to patch things up. We've we've seen all of that. Do we, do we really think that WWE are in reality going to have Sasha Banks just turn her back on Bailey? I don't think so because I think that's too obvious. I think if you're going to split these two up, you're going to have to have one's the babyface and one's the heel, right? Bailey is the ultimate heel in uh, the SmackDown Women's Division right now. Vince McMahon loves Bailey. He is such a big fan of Bailey. By all accounts, in recent booking meetings, he has singled out Bailey as one of the top talents on SmackDown, that he loves her heel role model character. I don't think he would change that. I think he knows that Sasha Banks, obviously she's money as a heel, but she's money as a baby face as well. I think this version of the Bailey character is more money as a heel. I don't think he would change what is working there. So I think Sasha Banks isn't the one to turn on Bailey on Sunday. I think Bailey is the one to turn on Sasha Banks. I think Bailey is going to take the viewpoint of you, you're the one that lost. You're the one that lost at SummerSlam. You're the one that lost the women's tag team titles. It's, I got to ditch you. I got to ditch dead weight. It's not about the golden role models, whatever. I've always been the role model. You've been riding my coattails kind of deal. So I think that Bailey will be the one to turn on Sasha Banks. I do think there'll be a title change, which means that Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax will become the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. This tag team of Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax, I must say this as well before I move on to the next match. So Monday Night on Raw, this is when we knew that Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax were going to be challenging Sasha Banks and Bailey at Payback. Now, to start the show, or at some point early in the show, we had Nia Jax walking backstage. Caleb, well, it's not Caleb Braxton, it's Charlie Caruso. Goes up to goes, Nia, what are, you, what are you doing here? You're meant to be suspended. And she goes, oh, I'm not suspended anymore. I apologize to Pat Burke. It's cool. Then you had Shayna Baszler confront her. They slap each other, call each other ugly, which apparently is all WWE can do to script female promos. Can we get past that? Can we get past, oh, it's a female promo, I'm going to insult your looks. I thought we'd had a woman's evolution. Can't we talk about being better in the ring? Something better than looks? You know, all calling each other a female dog? Can we get past that? That's such lazy writing. Such lazy writing. But when they had this face-off and were chatting backstage before Shayna Baszler was going to be facing, uh, who was it facing? Bailey, right? Soon as she's going to be facing Bailey, and it was Shayna Baszler, Nia Jax. The first thing that popped in my head, you can go see it on, on social media because I tweeted it before it happened. I went, oh no, I think we're going to get Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax versus Sasha Banks and Bailey at payback. And that's exactly what we got. That's exactly what we got. After the match, so the match is going on. We have Bailey versus Shayna Baszler. It doesn't go very long. Uh, Nia Jax comes out. She's standing at the top of the ramp. She's watching. We go to a commercial. Once the commercial's back, Nia Jax comes down to the ring. She starts beating up Shayna Baszler. She throws her into the apron, beating her up in the ring. All Bailey and Sasha Banks are doing are laughing and saying, you, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't mind. You go ahead and beat the hell out of each other. And suddenly, Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax just stop fighting. And stare at them and they chase them kind of up the ramp. And then we know that it's going to be Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax for the women's tag team titles. When did that happen? When did they suddenly become friends? Apparently in WWE, all it takes to become best friends or at least tag team partners is someone laughing. That storytelling, that logic there baffled me. She shoved you into the ring apron a mere seconds ago and they just stopped. And stared at them. Oh, we're friends now. How dumb is that? How dumb is that? And they're going to be the ones that dethrone Bailey and Sasha Banks at payback. When Bailey and Sasha Banks have beaten legitimate tag teams, they've beaten the Iconics, they've beaten Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross on SmackDown 2. Legitimate female tag teams, which, by the way, there aren't enough of. We need to have more female tag teams, by the way. I'm, I like Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez. I think they'd be great women's tag team champions. Give them the bouts. 
I just, I was, my, my head, my head nearly exploded when I saw that Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax, suddenly they're friends now. What the hell? Where's the logic there? There is, there is none. There is none. But I do think we're going to see a, a title change here. So I think Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax will be that dysfunctional tag team that are the tag team champions once this match is said and done. Next up, we have a tag team match. We have Dominic Mysterio teaming up with his father, Rey Mysterio, to take on Seth Rollins, the Monday Night Messiah, and Murphy. Now, I suppose technically, technically, I said there were no SummerSlam rematches, and there are not, but there is a Monday Night Raw rematch because we saw Dominic Mysterio and Rey Mysterio face off against Seth Rollins and Murphy Monday Night on Raw. Of course, uh, it ended in disqualification when Retribution attacked the Mysterios. So some people were saying, does this mean Seth Rollins involved in Retribution? I don't think so. Seth Rollins looked very happy Monday night on Raw that Retribution were attacking, attacking the Mysterios. We didn't see Retribution last night on SmackDown either. So I do think Retribution, they've got a factor in somehow to this show. Uh, I think the actual lineup of Retribution as well, uh, Monday night on Raw, was the actual lineup that we're going to see of Retribution going forward. At the Performance Center tapings, they'd used a lot of extras as the members of Retribution, hence why the sizes have differed so much in the last few weeks. But last week on Raw, that was pretty much the official lineup of Retribution, I think. Had the likes of Mia Yim, Dominic Dajakovic, Dio Madden in there, amongst some others. So I don't know if and when they're going to be, uh, their identities are going to be released or revealed or anything like that. We'll have to wait and see. But maybe they get involved in this match once again. I don't know. I don't think I want to see Retribution get involved in this one. To be honest, I have had no problem, really, with this Mysterios versus Seth Rollins feud. I think it's been pretty good. I think the storytelling has been pretty good. Obviously, we'll touch on the eye for an eye match a second in a a minute, but I think it's been okay. I think it's been okay. At this point, though, I do think they're stretching this out, and this is the frustrating thing for me here, is that they're having this rematch on Payback, But it's not even the end of the feud because it's already been announced that Monday night on Raw, we're going to have Seth Rollins versus Rey Mysterio once again. And that's meant to be the bookend of a feud. A bookend of a feud, by the way, which you had an eye for an eye match, which you removed your opponent's eye to win the match. And that's not the end of the feud. How how (laughs) this feud is insane. Now, again, I haven't hated this feud. I've actually liked quite a lot of the storytelling elements of this feud. I really enjoyed the build up to Dominic Mysterio's Uh, first match at SummerSlam. I thought Dominic Mysterio did a fantastic job at SummerSlam, arguably the match of the night. The following night on Raw, once again, I thought he did a great job. Obviously, there's a bit of smoke and mirrors, but he is very, very good. And he's going to be a real big babyface, Dominic Mysterio, in the future. The reason why he is going to be such a big babyface is because he can sell. He is a great seller. He is going to be great at getting heat for the heel. He's going to be great at doing a babyface comeback. He is going to be such a big babyface star. I really do think so. He's only 23 years old or something like that. He's got a lot to learn and he's got a lot that he can develop on. But I think he's going to be very, very good. And his first two appearances have been very, very good. And I'm glad for Rey Mysterio and Dominic Mysterio. Rey Mysterio said that it's been his dream to compete in a match with his son, on television, he did that Monday Night on Raw. He's done it here, or he will do it at a payback. And I think it's great to see. And like I said, I think Dominic Mysterio did a great job. As far as this feud, it's got to end soon, right? It's been going on for a long, long time, ever since the post Money in the Bank edition of Monday Night Raw, which was in May. And we're nearly in September now, and it's still going on. So hopefully, Monday Night on Raw, when we have Seth Rollins go up against Rey Mysterio, that will be the end of the feud. In terms of prediction for this one, I think Dominic Mysterio and Rey Mysterio have to win this one. The what, the stuff that Seth Rollins has put the Mysterio family through, eventually they have to win. They have to win. And this is what I predicted for SummerSlam. I predicted that Seth Rollins would beat Dominic Mysterio at SummerSlam, and he did. I predicted we were going to have the tag team match at Payback, which we are having now. And my prediction then is the same as it is now. I think the Mysterios will win this one. Then I think Rey Mysterio will win on Monday Night Raw. And then hopefully that's the feud done. Now, I know some people are speculating Dominic Mysterio is going to turn on his father. He's going to join Rey Mysterio. Uh, Rey Mysterio. He's going to join Seth Rollins. I don't think Dominic Mysterio will join Seth Rollins at this match. I would be very, very surprised if he joined him on Monday Night Raw, if I'm truthfully, truthfully honest. This is a guy that beat the hell out of him with a kendo stick and uh, popped his dad's eye out of his socket. Maybe they will. Maybe they will. 
it to me it just doesn't feel like the right time at the moment i understand that seth rollins is always looking for disciples and that kind of deal but as i mentioned it just doesn't i don't know it just doesn't feel right i do think dominic at some point will turn on his father and i think that'll be a great moment and it'll be a moment that people talk about and it'll be one of those epic wwe monday night raw moments that's on the highlight reels forever and a day however do i think they'll do that right now i think they can wait i think they can wait i would give him more time with his father I would give him more time developing in the ring and developing as a character. As I mentioned, the guy's really, really good and can be really, really good. He's got great potential as a sympathetic babyface. He's got a great comeback. Uh, he's got a great look and he can sell. He's like his father in the fact that he can sell. So I would give him more time to develop and do more stuff with his dad. Why not have them have a tag title run or do something like that? Have him compete against the Street Profits. Lord knows we need tag teams in WWE. We need tag teams on Monday Night Raw. We need tag teams on SmackDown. We need tag teams in NXT. WWE's focus on tag team wrestling in WWE right now is pretty appalling. And the tag team divisions desperately need legitimate good tag teams. So I'd be down to see the Mysterios face against the Street Profits or something like that. It'd be better than having the Street Profits face off against Angel Garza and Andrade for the millionth time. I think we've seen that match to death at this point. So... I'm going to go with the Mysterios winning here, and then I think Rey Mysterio will defeat Seth Rollins Monday night on Raw, and then hopefully that can be the end of this feud and a nice end to the chapter of the Mysterios versus Seth Rollins saga. Next up, we have Keith Lee facing off against Randy Orton. It was the match Monday night on Raw that got interrupted by the WWE champion Drew McIntyre. It's Keith Lee's first pay-per-view event. This is going to be very, very interesting because... Keith Lee versus Randy Orton. My concern here with this match is that WWE was booking themselves into a corner. Now, I did a full stream and I did a video on Keith Lee's Raw debut, my issues with it, things that needed to be changed. We can speak about Keith Lee's music. We can speak about Keith Lee's ring attire. By all accounts, Keith Lee is going to get new music at Payback. So at least they're aware that that's a problem because it is bad. His new music is bad. So at least WWE are trying to resolve that one. I don't understand still why Keith Lee just can't compete in his ring gear that he competed in in NXT. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Hopefully, we'll see him come out in his normal ring gear at Payback, but I don't think we will. My issue with this was that Look, it's, it's, it's great to have Keith Lee going up against Randy Orton. And that side of the argument, people are saying, look, Keith Lee, he's having his first pay-per-view match against Randy Orton. He interrupted Randy Orton on Raw. He had a match with Randy Orton on Raw. What a great debut. I don't disagree with that in the slightest. I compared Keith Lee's debut promo and debut moment the same as Chris Jericho with The Rock. How do you get someone uh, hotter and how do you make someone debut and feel as important as possible? You have them interrupt arguably the biggest star on the brand. And that is Randy Orton right now. Randy Orton is the top heel in WWE. Maybe not for long with Roman Reigns at the moment, but he's the top heel this year, has been the top heel in WWE. Having Keith Lee interrupt him and have a match on Monday Night Raw is a great way to debut him. It makes Keith Lee feel important. It makes Keith Lee feel special. I don't disagree with that. However, I do disagree in the way that he was booked in that match. Regardless of what Keith Lee wants to say, that wasn't a no contest on Monday Night Raw. That was a disqualification. Drew McIntyre came down, attacked Randy Orton, and Keith Lee disappeared. It made Keith Lee look not important. And ultimately, it was a disqualification and Keith Lee lost. And I'm sure the majority of people will say, ah, the casual fan doesn't even look at that. I think they do. I think they do. I think I think that doesn't. that's a disservice to the casual fan that maybe isn't as obsessed with professional wrestling as you or I. But I think people do notice that kind of deal. And even if they don't up front, they do subconsciously. Subconsciously, if you know that a guy has lost, it does impact you. It impacts your perception of the character. Even as hardcore professional wrestling fans, it does impact your perception of the character if they win or lose. Wins or losses do matter. I know WWE try and claim that they don't, but they really do in the eyes of a lot of professional wrestling fans. My concern here, as I mentioned, is that WWE is booking themselves into a corner. And what by that I mean is, look, Randy Orton lost at SummerSlam. He lost at SummerSlam to Drew McIntyre. He lost clean, in a sense. I know it was a backslide, but it was a wrestling move. He lost. Randy Orton can't lose again to Keith Lee here because it's obvious that Randy Orton at some point is going to be challenging Drew McIntyre again for the WWE Championship. He is the de facto number one contender for the WWE title, so... 
Should Randy Orton be doing the job to Keith Lee here? No, you've built this character up by beating Edge. He punted Edge in the head. He punted Christian in the head. He punted Big Show in the head. He punted Ric Flair in the head. He punted uh, Shawn Michaels in the head. He's punted Drew McIntyre in the head three times. You've built this character up. It doesn't make any sense for him to do the job to Keith Lee here, especially considering that Randy Orton lost at SummerSlam too. However, Keith Lee... This is his second match on Monday Night Raw. His first match was against Randy Orton, and I don't care what Keith Lee said. He lost. It wasn't a no contest. He lost. So do you have Keith Lee lose here to Randy Orton again? No, because that hurts Keith Lee, and he's just debuted on the brand. You want to see him as a potential main event star, a big deal, a future world champion. A future world champion doesn't lose their first two matches on the brand. So it's a difficult one here. I don't know really where I'm going to go with this one because... Neither guy needs to lose. So do they have a screwy finish? Drew McIntyre, Monday night on Raw, he got kicked three times in the head. The medical update was that he'd gone to the dreaded local medical facility and he had a potential fractured skull. It was a potentially career-threatening injury. Should Drew McIntyre realistically get involved in this one? No, because he got involved on Monday night on Raw. And I think that annoyed people. And if you're going to sell that... Drew McIntyre's got this career-threatening injury and he's got a fractured skull. Why on earth would he be back six days later? What does he have miracle healing powers similar to The Undertaker? No, he's Drew McIntyre. He's the WWE champion. So Drew McIntyre, of course, he will return and they're going to have the match between him and Randy Orton at Clash of Champions for the WWE Championship. But I don't think Drew McIntyre should be in this one. So if I was going to predict a finish, I think they're going to have some form of a screwy finish, I think. I think they'll go over maybe a proper no contest or a double count out or something like that. Realistically, it would be great if Keith Lee could get the win here because I really do think that would elevate him. However, I think if anyone is going to win this match, I think it's going to be Randy Orton. And I hate to say that, and I'm sure the internet and social media will go crazy if Randy Orton does win. But you look at the person who, who really needs to win more... Well, well, I think Keith Lee probably needs to win more. But who do I think, if anyone is going to win it, will win it? I think Randy Orton, because they want to keep him protected and build him up for his WWE Championship match against Drew McIntyre at Clash of Champions. And I think the rationale behind that will be, well, it's Randy Orton. Keith Lee losing to Randy Orton, that's no, that's no uh, diss to Keith Lee or anything like that. But I don't know if that's the right call. So I'm going to go with like a no contest or a double count out. But if someone is going to win, then I think WWE would put over Randy Orton in this one. Next, we have our main event. It's a no holds barred triple threat match for the WWE Universal Championship. The new WWE Universal Champion, The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, defending against the former WWE Universal Champion, Braun Strowman, and the returning Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns returned at SummerSlam. He was on Friday Night SmackDown last night, but the big, big news coming out of SmackDown was that Roman Reigns is now apparently a Paul Heyman guy. Now, I won't go into this too much because I am going to do a single video about Roman Reigns' his affiliation with Paul Heyman, which I think is a fantastic move. I will say this. I think it's an absolutely stroke of genius move by WWE. The longest time I've said this, this is, and this, is, this isn't anything new. This isn't anything new. The biggest babyfaces in professional wrestling history have always, always come up, started out and begun as a heel. You're a great heel and you get so over that you become a babyface. Look at The Rock. Look at Steve Austin. Look at Triple H. Look at Shawn Michaels. Look at even John Cena, right? John Cena started off as a heel, then he got popular. It's the same thing. It should be the same thing with Roman Reigns here. And I know Roman Reigns was a heel when he was part of The Shield. But ever since he split from them, he's been a babyface. And Vince McMahon, to his credit, we can we can slag him off and we can say all these terrible things about him. But Vince McMahon, to his credit, has realized, finally, it's only taken, what, six years or something like that. But he's realized that whatever they were doing with Roman Reigns, trying to shove him down the throats of fans and get people to like him doesn't work in the modern day of professional wrestling. Fans hate to be told who they have to like. Fans want to at least think they have the decision to like who they should like. At least think that, right? You can manipulate them. You can manipulate them and that should be the best bookers and the best creative writers can do that. 
You can manipulate fans to get eventually the reaction that you want. And this is exactly what they're doing with Roman Reigns here. They've realized the way to get Roman Reigns really over, and Roman Reigns is over. Let's not say that Roman Reigns isn't over or anything like that, but they want him to be that tippy-top babyface like John Cena and get that reaction of John Cena. Now, Roman Reigns does get that reaction. He does. He does get the mixture of reaction, but they want him to get universally cheered, and they want him to be even better than John Cena. And they're going to try something different. After years and years of doing this with Roman Reigns, but even prior to that, doing this with John Cena, of forcing the big baby face down the throats, goody two-shoes, the fans reject it because they don't like being told what to do. They're trying something different, which you have to give them credit for. They have turned Roman Reigns heel. I say he's a heel, but this is going to make him more popular than ever. A Roman Reigns with an edge, a Roman Reigns that can that can be himself, a Roman Reigns that is cool, and a Roman Reigns with Paul Heyman is going to get him over with the crowd. I know their fans aren't there at the moment, but this is going to make him the most popular character on the show, even if he wasn't already. But this is going to take him to another level. This is going to make every Roman Reigns segment, every Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman segment exciting. And I think it's a fantastic move by WWE. It's a move certainly that I and I think everyone didn't see coming. The reveal was great on SmackDown last night. I think you're allowing Roman Reigns to be more like himself and cut these great promos. Roman Reigns can cut a great promo. If you let him cut a promo, he can do it. If you write something terrible for him, like suffering sucker tash, people are going to hate it. And people are going to hate it. Roman Reigns, if he's allowed to be him, he can. Do, he's money. He is money. He's always been money. No one's ever questioned that. No one's ever questioned the ability. No one's ever questioned the character and the potential of Roman Reigns. What people question is the booking of Roman Reigns. What people question is the writing of Roman Reigns. That is the problem. So this move with Paul Heyman is, I think, a stroke of genius. I really do think so. Roman Reigns doesn't need a mouthpiece. And I don't think Paul Heyman will be a mouthpiece. I think this is similar to Paul Heyman being with CM Punk. CM Punk can cut a promo. CM Punk's one of the best promos in the history of professional wrestling. He didn't need Paul Heyman as a mouthpiece. What he needed Paul Heyman for was credibility and just it was an addition to the act. And that's exactly what Paul Heyman is going to be with Roman Reigns here. He's, he might cut some promos for Roman Reigns. He might do that. But the reality is he is an addition to the Roman Reigns act. He makes Roman Reigns feel a bit more legit. He makes Roman Reigns feel a bit more heelish. And they can bounce off of each other. They can do something different. They can have fun. This is a great move. And I think it's something that has been crying out for the longest time with Roman Reigns. Even the slight edgy nature that he had when he returned at SummerSlam, people loved. People loved that closing segment last night on SmackDown. And I think people are going to love this newer version, this altered version of Roman Reigns with Paul Heyman. So I'm really excited about this match. Braun Strowman's an afterthought. I think Braun Strowman's going to take the pin in this match. The Fiend Bray Wyatt is becoming a babyface. He is becoming a babyface. I predicted this as well the last few weeks. I felt like this was the case coming into SummerSlam. I felt like Braun Strowman had turned heel and The Fiend had turned babyface. People, for some reason, are against this. People are saying that The Fiend can't be a babyface. I couldn't disagree more. The Fiend absolutely can be a babyface. The Fiend can be an anti-hero babyface. And to people that say, oh, how is that even possible? Look at The Undertaker. Now, The Fiend and The Undertaker, they're not the same. They're absolutely not the same. But The Undertaker, when he debuted, was an evil dead guy, a zombie, essentially. He buried people alive and he put people in caskets. Do you think that character could have worked as a babyface? He was one of the biggest babyfaces of all time. So The Fiend absolutely can be a babyface. Again, it's the same with Roman Reigns. The Fiend, such a great villain that you have to turn him babyface eventually. The Terminator, Darth Vader, Thanos, everyone like that. Eventually, they become the babyface in the end. That's how great villains work. The Joker. The Joker's got his own movie now because he's such a great villain. And it's the same with The Fiend Bray Wyatt here. He's such a great villain that you have to turn him babyface eventually. The Fiend over the last year, has probably done the best merchandise numbers than anyone. That's including Roman Reigns, whether it's the gloves, whether it's the masks, whether it's the Fireflies Funhouse puppets, all of that sort of stuff. Bray Wyatt uh, is the top merch seller. He is money. So think how much he can make as a baby face. And his character doesn't need to change. All that changes is his opponents. So I do think Roman Reigns is going to win Sunday. 
And I know that will annoy people because The Fiend has just won the championship and people will have this perception that, oh, The Fiend's getting robbed again. Well, realistically, when The Fiend lost the title to Goldberg at Super Showdown, the argument was you shouldn't have put the title on The Fiend in the first place, right? That was the argument. The Fiend doesn't need the Universal Championship and he doesn't. He doesn't. So Roman Reigns winning the title. He doesn't pin The Fiend. He'll pin Braun Strowman. I have no doubts about that. Braun Strowman is a heel right now too. And then you can have Roman Reigns and The Fiend go off and they can do their thing. Think of the promos that you can have with The Fiend and Paul Heyman. Think of the promos you can have with The Fiend and Roman Reigns. It's really exciting. I, as I mentioned, I'm probably more excited for Payback than I was for SummerSlam. That's because of this main event. This pairing of Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman, I think, is a stroke of genius. I'm excited to see Keith Lee debut as well. So I'm really, really excited for this. And I think the main event is going to be great. It's no holes barred triple threat. We're going to see weapons. We're going to see plunder. They'll brawl all over the Thunderdome too. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I think this will really cement Roman Reigns as this heel star. And I think it's great. They need star power in this main event. And uh, I'm sure it'll be a good one. But as always, this is just one man's opinion. What are your thoughts? What are your predictions for Payback tomorrow night? Streaming live and exclusive on the WWE Network. Let me know your thoughts and predictions in the comment section below. I'll be sure to reply and respond to all of your comments. Really enjoy interacting with you guys on this channel. If you have enjoyed this video, please do smash a like on the like button as well. It really does help us out. Get up the rankings and get into people's recommendation feeds here on YouTube. But most importantly, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to Wrestle News 365. You can do that by clicking the bottom right-hand corner of the screen right now. Or if you wait a few seconds, there'll be a subscribe button at the end of this video along with another video for you to watch. You can also follow us on our social media platforms. The handles are on the screen right now the links are in the description box below it's at 365 wrestle on twitter and at wrestle news 365 on facebook and instagram so be sure to give us a like or a follow there if you haven't already and whilst you're in the comments whilst you're in the description box you can take advantage of our offer uh, with our sponsor manscaped just go to manscaped.com and you can get 20 percent off and free shipping using the code 365 wrestle that's manscaped.com Use the code 365 Wrestle for 20% off and free shipping. You won't regret it. Thank you very much for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. And I'll speak for you again very, very soon. Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.